Well, I took an, the A level in uh, modern European history, I think about 50 years ago. And I always remember there was a subject, one of the subjects we had to look at was the unification of Italy. It was a nice, neat subject within uh, this va vast uh, matter of uh, modern European history. That is to say, between uh, 1855, shall we say, and 1870, how all those uh, states and statelets that made up uh, Italy at that time, the peninsula, I mean, uh, duchies, republics and kingdoms, were all united by 1870, of course, including the Papal States. One of those statelets was the uh, Archduchy of Tuscany. And I'm just going to look at Tuscany between 1500 and uh, 1860, something like that. That's the, that's the uh, equation, the historical setting at any rate. By 50, this uh, Tuscany at that time would be ruled by the Medici family, very well known, Grand Duke, Dukes and then Grand Dukes. Within their territory at that time, 1500, the Republic of Pisa had been absorbed. The great maritime republic, one of them, it had been defeated by Genoa, its rival, and then went into decline from the 13th century. But also contributing to that decline was the silting up of its port, Porto Pisano, which was on the coast. Of course, if we know the river Arno, Pisa's upriver, and then further on we have Florence, the capital. So with the cl clotting up of Porto Pisano, uh, the Grand Dukes by that time had to look out for another place, you know, for their port for Tuscany, a very important uh, project. And Cosimo I uh, discovered or found or set his eyes upon a little place called Livorno, which was just a landing place with a couple of towers to protect it from marauding pirates and so on like that. He decided to develop this place. He built a harbour, warehouses, quarantine facilities, all sorts of things which would be suitable. He wanted to make it a commercial success as well for, for his state of Tuscany. He also constructed a canal between uh, Livorno and Pisa itself for the easy transport of uh, uh, materials and some goods. He also created a fleet of ships, uh, uh, galleys, I should say, rather than ships, but galleys. And then he uh, founded the military order of St. Stephen, which was to manage the fleet. Now then he had to find people to manage uh, or to work the fleet uh, physically, and he invited Greeks uh, from Tuscany, who were his subjects, if we can use the word subject in this context, and Greeks from other parts of Italy, because they were known for their, as being mariners as well. Some of them were also very successful merchants. So they came along in the, the 1570s and settled there and, and were looking after the fleet. Now, then his son, Ferdinand I, was even more ambitious than his father. And he issued invitations, famous ones, 1591 and 1593, in English, they're called the uh, Livornian Laws, but they weren't quite laws. It was an invitation. And this is what the opening phrase, very important. To all merchants of whatever nation, from East and West, Spaniards, Portuguese, Greeks, Germans and Italians, Hebrews, Turks, Moors, Armenians, Persians and others, greetings, he said. And one of these uh, landed with Elizabeth I, I believe, as a matter. So widespread was this. Now, what were the inducements to attract people to live or no, to make it a real commercial success? It was already becoming so, but he wanted more. There would be complete freedom of religion, which is almost a shocking surprise for many people. There were no what we would call today extradition treaties. In other words, whatever business you had done before, or you were in debt or something like that, or free, nothing, you would be safe in Livorno. Uh, the Grand Dukes would uh, ensure your safety. There were very special attractive tax exemptions and low tariffs and all the excellent facilities, including very strong uh, fortifications, 
which he went on, and his son, and even the son of uh, Ferdinand went on to do. So with this, a lot of people became very quickly interested. A lot of uh, this news spread like mad all over the Mediterranean, and Livorno actually became one of the most important places in the Mediterranean, along with Smyrna and, and uh, uh, Constantinople and so on. So very, very important place it became. We hardly know of it today, of course, ba barely, but at that time, in the 17th and 18th century, it was a, a big, big uh, deal, as it were. Well, what of the Armenians? Well, the Armenians had a very long connection with Italy, of course. I mean, we think of the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia, which alas came to an end uh, in 1375 because of Mamluk assaults from Egypt. Uh, but there was a, a great deal of trading going on between Pisa, Genoa, Venice, and, uh, and, uh, and the, kingdom of the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia. When that unfortunately collapsed, many refugees landed in Italy uh, and settled there. But even before that, when uh, Ani uh, collapsed in the 11th century, uh, further uh, to, uh, in eastern Anatolia, if I can put it like that, or Ar Armenia, uh, many refugees also came to Italy. There were monks as well who came and settled. And one of them became, uh, some of them became the Order of St. Basil in 1302 in Genoa, and they had houses in various parts of Italy. There were uh, Armenian saints well known in Italy. For example, I had this book sent to me the other day. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the saints of Luca, which is in uh, Tuscany, San Davino, who died there in 1050. There was uh, San Miniatus in Florence. If you've been to Florence, I hope so, when you, when you climb up the mountain, you're overlooking the city, there's this wonderful church dedicated to him with his relics and miniatus, again from the 11th century. The Certosa of Pisa, which is a remarkable monastery, but that was founded by an Armenian merchant from Pisa. So a long, long connection. Well, what about Livorno itself? Well, the first, we understand that there would have been uh, Armenian merchants certainly visiting from, from Venice, which had a very particular connection with the Armenians, to see what was going on there, what, was, uh, you know, what sort of business activity could be, uh, could be arranged and so on. But the first name we have was uh, Khodja Kirakos Mirman or Mirmanian, who came from Persia, that was in 1582, and he's described as the consul sent by the Shah himself to find out what was going on already this uh, news spreading uh, far and wide. Now, of course, the term consul, what does that mean exactly? N not necessarily in the sen modern sense, but it could be that he was shopping for the Tsar, for the Tsar, I'm sorry, for the Shah, or he would be representing, if he's representing uh, some Armenians already there, they're already settling there, you know, if, if that's his response. And many, many other consuls came and settled, the British, Swedish, French, and also on Portuguese, all had consulates there very, very soon. Now, as the Armenian community began to grow, there was uh, a need for a church. Uh, as many of us know, perhaps, where Armenians get together, if I may say, uh, one thing, at least up to modern times, would be finding a church, founding a church. Before I go on to that, about the church itself, it's maybe good to have a look at the other nations, what they call the Nazioni, because Livorno already had the uh, title La Città dei Nazioni, the city of the nations, so cosmopolitan had it become by 1600, 1600. And I'd like to look just very quickly at the non-Christian uh, non communities that were there. First of all, the Jewish community, which became very famous, and there's a lot of literature written about the Jewish community of Livorno. But these were Sephardic Jews, originally from Spain and Portugal, of course, where they had, uh, were excluded, or some of them had become Christian, forced to become Christian. But they came in their hundreds, one could say, because there was no ghetto. The, the Grand Duke forbade the erection of a ghetto, even though, regrettably, the Holy See was pressurizing the Jews. No, you've got to have a ghetto with a wall and so on. No, no, they didn't, no, he's there to protect them. They had complete freedom 
and they flourished. Now what about Muslims? There was mention of Turks and Persians, but actually I doubt if there were any actual Muslim merchants. There would have been Armenians and Syrians, Christian merchants arriving. The only, I think the first time that we know that there were actually uh, Muslim merchants would have been about in the 1760s after uh, the Habsburgs and the Ottomans had signed various treaties in the 1740s. Then the uh, Muslim merchants began and they didn't want a mosque, they just were happy to worship in the uh, residence of their consul. But they did ask for a cemetery and they got the cemetery right enough. But however, there was the Banyo. The Banyo was the place, a big fortress-like thing in the port uh, area, uh, which contained at least a thousand slaves, Muslim slaves at this time, who were working in the galleys or doing construction work for the city, uh, or were making biscuits in the Banyo. Why biscuits? Because of course, the sailors would be taking biscuits, not bread to sea, that would be last, long lasting. In the Banyo, I won't go into the complication, but there were two little mosques for their use. In re reciprocal relations, because of the Christian slaves in Algeria, and in Constantinople particularly, they were able to have, or there were clergy who were able to have access to the Christian slaves there. Moving on to the Protestants, we have Anglicans, Calvinists, Lutherans, Waldensians probably, coming and going free as birds. And they could worship, but not in physical churches. That didn't come until the 1840s. Uh, so they met, uh, not secretly, there was no secret, they went in places where they could be and, and pray and worship and so on and so forth. So that, they were quite content with that. Then we had Catholic foreigners. There were English and Irish merchants and others, French and Spanish and so on, Christians. Uh, they could go attend any church in the, in the town, in the city, of course, because they're using the Latin liturgy, it would be familiar to them. But on the Via Madonna, which will feature a bit in the story, uh, there was a Franciscan church in which, apart from the high altar, there were four national altars, one for the Corsicans, one for the French, one for the Portuguese, and one for the uh, Flemish German community. And they could meet there for mass, uh, and have sermons, I presume, in, the, in, the, in their own languages. It must have been terribly crowded on a Sunday. I don't know how they all managed it. But anyway, that was the national church, again on the Via Madonna. Now we come to an interesting group, Catholics, Greeks, but of the Byzantine rite. And this is where you tie up with the Italia, uh, Greek Italia. So they, uh, they had a church quite quickly. In 1604, they had their own church. Where? on the Via Madonna, of course. You know, and this is going to become the Via Nazio, Dei Nazioni, this particular Via Madonna, anyway. We know that the Greek Orthodox community went to the Greek Catholic Church, the Greek, uh, uh, and attended. Whether they received the sacraments, I don't know, or whatever, but that, as a meeting place, anyway, for social gatherings and so on. Uh, they didn't get their church until much later in the 18th century, and even then it was, there was no, nothing on the front door to say, but everybody knew what was going on. But anyway, that's all. Now, regarding the Armenians themselves in this case, going back to them, uh, there had obviously been discussions on, on what to do. Now, they couldn't have an, uh, an apostolic church, those are the Armenians in union with Echmir Zin, although they could meet quietly and, and worship. Uh, so there was some d discussion about uh, how, how to deal with this, because the majority of Armenians would have been apostolic. The minority would have been Catholic, and there were no Protestants then, not till the 19th century, really, from in the Ottoman Empire. Finally, there was a meeting in 1669 of a group of well-to-do Armenian Catholic the merchants and so on to take a serious step to, uh, to uh, collect money, and they signed an accord to that effect. Uh, that uh, people would give donations and so on so that they could buy the ground and then build the church on the ground. In 1692, enough cash had been gathered and they bought the garden, a garden of the Francis, where? On the Via Madonna again. This features a bit. 
However, they didn't have enough money to, uh, uh, to finish. They could start building a church, but not enough money. So what they did, they signed a second accord, again to receive donations, and somebody was in charge. All this with the Grand Duke's permission, they had to have that. Um, but in addition, a special tax was laid upon Armenian goods coming in and out of the port. Whether they, it seems to be everybody, every merchant, not just Catholic ones, but also apostolic merchants, and nobody seemed to object, which was quite interesting, as far as I can gather. So that is going on. Now, in the meantime, the Archbishop of Pisa, who was in charge of Livorno, Livorno didn't get a, a bishop of its own until 1808. He wrote to Rome. He was a, a difficult man. He was in, in power, dare I say, for almost 40 years with a very long aristocratic name. And he warns Rome not to be too hasty in granting permission to the Armenians because they are well, from the Italian of an unstable character. You know, <laughs> sorry, Father. <laughs> Dal carattere instabile, you know, so, so watch it, he's saying. So in order to allay fears uh, about this, the community in general appointed a gentleman by the name of Aga Mateus, very respectable man with a, a bit of money and so on. He, he even had a title from the Austrian Empire. He was sent to Rome uh, to explain to Propaganda Fide, which was found, had been founded in 1622, and incidentally had taken under its wing the Armenian community in Livorno. They sent along priests to celebrate the liturgy, which had to be in a Latin church, of course. Uh, so, and they paid for the, for the, to the priest who would do that. Armenian-speaking or Armenian, uh, already Armenian Catholic uh, priests were doing that. So he, the, he has to stay two years, can you imagine? Uh, trying to persuade because things were very slow. He had to live in a certain style because he was uh, representing the probity and the wealth of the Armenian community already of the merchant class. There were other Armenians mean, also uh, working in wo workshops and so on and so forth. Eventually they agree, and I'm cutting it right down, uh, they eventually, propaganda said, yes, on condition that the community signs eight propositions and then come back with the Grand Duke's uh, uh, recommendations on, and then we will give you permission. So this is given, I can't go into the eight propositions, but in general it meant the Archbishop of Pisa would have over, oversight ship, is that right? The oversight of the, of the matter. Uh, the priest has to sign the, uh, or declare the uh, confession of faith, etc. And no unusual practices must be introduced into the, into the church. Anyway, that's agreed. And straight away, when that's done, 12 foundation stones are blessed on the, on, on the site uh, in, the, in the Armenian tradition. And the first stone, and perhaps Father Nasus will correct me, is dedicated to St. Peter. And who was the godfather? The Grand Duke himself. Because this was an occasion, not just religious, but also secular. So there were quite, he didn't go himself, but he had the representative. Uh, and this was, this ceremony was performed by a former Catholicus of Sis, who was living in Rome. And I presume he must have slipped over to Rome uh, in, in communion. Uh, but he performed that ceremony. So the building goes on, and the same gentleman, Aya Mateus, is in charge of it for a number of years. And it reaches completion, except for the interior, which is, is, hasn't been decorated yet. So what happens? He's murdered. What a shock to the community. As he's coming out of very early mass, he's murdered, stabbed 16 or 17 times by one of his employees, a Georgian, who immediately rushes off to the port, Obviously, it's all been planned. He takes ship and the ship disappears. And he's, he's gone from the story. Nobody can get hold of him because there's no extradition <laughs> treaty, of course. So it comes back like that. Um, so it was carefully planned. What had happened was that he had been put in charge, because I, Mateus was no young man. He'd been put in charge of the workmen's on, but wasn't doing good work. And he was dismissed and out of revenge, uh, he was stabbed. So then there's the funeral of Aya Mateus. Uh, his 
Two children are not present there. They must have buried him very quickly, but a funeral, grand funeral for him because of his state, <laughs> status in, this, in the community. So word goes out to his two children. One is a son who's at the Obanum College. And I, it is a bit of a shadowy creature, I don't, a creature, sorry, a gentleman, um, whether he was already ordained or a student. <laughs> but there's a married daughter in Tabriz, which was an important Armenian centre in uh, Persia. She's married, as I say, with a small child. Her husband, in the meantime, is in Palermo, in Sicily, doing business. So they all come back expecting to inherit, you know, some money, etc. On the contrary, they're played by creditors, right, left and centre. Uh, everything has to be sold. The property of I. Mateus, uh, the poor woman, Lucia, has to sell her jewels and even her dresses uh, to, pay, <laughs> to pay the community. It's a terrible, shameful uh, incident. Uh, so the, the, the family appealed to Rome about this, Look what's, and to the Grand Duke. So it's decided the Archbishop must investigate to find out well, what, what, what's going on. He is in sympathy with the family and, uh, and uh, orders the community to pay them 20,000 scudi, which I think is something like pieces of eight, something like that, because they're using all kinds of monetary uh, matters which are difficult to understand sometimes. Um, and so the tax is renewed on the goods in order to pay the family. But in addition, the Archbishop orders the church to be opened and consecrated immediately, even though it's not quite finished inside. He performs the ceremony of consecration, but then the liturgy is celebrated by a bishop from uh, Constantinople, and there's a big celebration. This is in January, on January the 1st, 1714. And the celebrations go on until, of course, the Epiphany, uh, January the 6th. There's great uh, ceremony that it says something about magnificence and so on and so forth uh, on that occasion. So that's the consecration of the church and it starts to function. I could give you a description of the church, but maybe that could, if we had time later, what we know. There's, there aren't many Armenian features in it because, of course, they. Uh, one, uh, one condition was that it must not look unusual on this Via Madonna. It must fit in with the other churches, you know. So it's a very Baroque uh, thing. I have, I'll show you some photos in a moment at, the, at the end. Uh, and the interior is, they have some Armenian features. Uh, they had a, a baldacchino over the altar, as far as I understand, and the curtain for the, uh, for the liturgy. Now, I'll just touch on two matters. Uh, there are many matters, actually, about the experience of the Armenian uh, Catholics. And indeed, it affects also, I think, the Armenian community as a whole. There's a very serious incident, but it's slightly comic as well, I have to say. There's an Armenian Catholic coffee shop owner who's on his deathbed. So he sends a message to Father Kalyan, the parish, I mean, Catholic parish priest, please bring me the sacrament. And he rings the bell, the lovely new clock t uh, tower, and gathers a little procession to set off. In the meantime, a Latin Catholic priest from the cathedral, although it's not strictly a cathedral, they call it collegiata or something like that, he's very interested in this. And it's near his, uh, the house is near it. So he decides to go along himself with the blessed sacrament. He arrives at the door and knocks on the door, and there are two carers in there, two Armenian carers who look at, appointed by the community to look after the dying man. Uh, oh, no, 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 not you, not you, no, no, we have our thing, and look, they're here at the end of the street. With the well, the gentleman, the Latin, goes off in a terrible huff, you know, a terrible huff, he goes back to the cathedral, and everybody's wondering what's going to happen now. The, the good de dying man dies, he's given uh, Father Kelly and sees to his sp uh, spiritual needs. And the two carers, what do they do? They take ship and leave the city out of fear. And not only that, the Armenian community are also perplexed and lock themselves away. Fearing, I presume, the uh, response of the Latin community in general. We must remember this is a port where all sorts of persons are coming and going. There's no established aristocracy there. It's not like Venice or Lucca. 
This is a new city, the newest in Italy at that time. So all kinds of persons, and it could be an opportunity with a little disturbance to attack the Armenians who are also trading in precious stones and silks and very expensive material. And uh, so they do. So then this commotion, what happens? The Latin Catholic priest complains to the preposto. He's the man in charge of the parish of Livorno under the jurisdiction of the Archbishop. He writes, they are complaining about that. The Archbishop writes, Rome, these Armenians are not accepting Catholic sa uh, sacraments, this, that and the other. So uh, there's a big fuss about that. And uh, Propaganda Fide asks the Archbishop, look, can you look at the case carefully and find out what happened exactly and try to make sure it doesn't happen again. This is an embarrassing incident. So he writes um, a document the normativa with five articles. I can't go into those, all the details, but it, it demonstrates, look, this Armenian, Catholic, this Armenian church here is really meant as a help to the preposto, you know. It's subservient, in other words, and if there are other matters like that. It's putting the Armenian Catholics and the church and parish, and of course it does affect uh, the whole community as well because uh, Almost certainly uh, some of the uh, apostolic are also visiting. Uh, you know, this is a, a place to meet, a social occasion and so on. An administrative place, you know, for keeping documents and everything else. So a group of army accept this because they just want calm. So they sign an agreement to this and that's fine, everything. So, but on the other hand, their complaints are sent to Rome. Look, this, you know, this cannot be. They're interfering with us here this proposto, preposterous proposto, one, one is inclined to say about him. Then propaganda says, writes back uh, to the archbishop and says, look, can you please make sure that the proposto does not vex the Armenian too, many, too much? So all this thing sort of dies down a little. But that's an example, interesting uh, interchange there. Then the second incident I just want to talk about, and as I say, there are quite a number of them, is the, the case of the three Christmas masses. As you may know, in the Catholic Church, in the Latin Catholic Church at any rate, uh, priests are able to celebrate mass three times on Christmas Day, three times each on Christmas Day, you know. Uh, something like that, as far as I know. Is that right, Bruce? You seem to know about these things. <laughs> it comes to the ear of another archbishop, uh, that uh, the Armenians are celebrating three Masses on Christmas Day. And he's rather puzzled by this. Is this what they're supposed to be doing? This sounds very Latin to me. Very interesting. It's not, oh, they're becoming Latinized. So it's, uh, he writes to Rome for advice about this. And there, there's some discussion about it. Um, and uh, they decide, what was the date? 1755, it's forbidden for them to celebrate. Uh, they dis what, what was the, how did they come to that? Well, I'm sure some of us here know already. The Dominican Missal, when it was translated into Armenian, of course, th some of the ceremonies of the Latin church went into the Fratres Unitoris in Nakhichevan and elsewhere, and they were celebrating uh, some Latin things, uh, taking it for granted. And this then influenced some of the priests who were visiting from the area, and there were comings and goings and so on. So they said, well, we'll, we'll do it here in uh, Livorno. But it was stopped, and the date it stopped is very interesting, uh, because it's 1755, and the Pope at the time uh, was Benedict XIV, uh, of course. And he'd already issued, in fact, he issued three documents about this, saying we must really at the end of we must respect the oriental liturgies and rites there must be no latinization etc etc and it's just at this point <coughs> excuse me that this decision is made and they should not be celebrating three christmas masses because it's a latin uh, tradition it's not nothing to do with the oriental uh, liturgies and so on anyway that's just uh, a little point now, as with the other nations, not only in Livorno, but in places like Smyrna and Constantinople, the administration of, the, of these uh, nations uh, is run usually by 
an assembly, you know, elected by the, by the people and elected regularly and they look after charitable matters if need be, the collection of money, distribution, etc., etc. Um, with the Armenians, of course, they had one. And sometimes it ran very smoothly, matters, but at other times not so matter because the merchants who are meant to be involved are too busy, you know, with their, with their business. And so things could go awry. There were people who were not worthy of the job, shall we say, were elected and then there was mismanagement and so on. Not just among Armenians, because I know, for, uh, I know very clearly that in Smyrna, the British assembly of the British factory was also can be mismanaged and people not turning up for meetings and so on. So it's not an Armenian weakness. It's anybody, as we know perhaps with in parish life about people not turning up when they, they, they said they were going to turn up. Anyway, there's a whole lot of stuff about that. Very interesting, but too data. But I come uh, to a moment that is of some interest perhaps for us here. Um, at one point, the governor of Livorno, who was uh, representing the Grand Duke, got so fed up with all this, uh, complaints to him about so-and-so is not doing etc., etc., etc. He said, look, if you don't behave yourself, more or less, I'm going to impose non-Armenian administrators <laughs> on, your, on your... Oh, they were outraged and got themselves in order quite quickly. But also, in this moment, he said, you've got to, you're going now, from now on, to have nothing to do with uh, propaganda fide. You must elect your own parish priest. You must present three names to the Grand Duke, and he will choose the parish priest, and he will be paid by the Grand Duke. So this was uh, quite new, although in the Armenian church, as Father Vrej may say, I know this can happen, as I witnessed myself in Istanbul some years ago where the people um, make a contribution to the to choice of the parish priest or the deacon, whatever it may be. Now, why is this a change? It's because there's a new dynasty. Already, as I mentioned, 1737, the Habsburg-Lorraine dynasty comes into effect. And the second Grand Duke of this dynasty is Leopold I, who is the brother of no less a person than Joseph II, Emperor of Austria who was the great, uh, well, I won't say great, some people wouldn't think, but he was suppressing monasteries right, left and centre. He was reordering church life, uh, etc. Not that he wasn't, he was still Catholic, but he, being a, a son of the Enlightenment and so on, uh, contemplative orders didn't make sense. You had to be active and doing something. You see. Now his brother, uh, Leopold, who later became emperor, uh, and actually they were brothers to Marie Antoinette of Austria and another sister was the queen of uh, two Sicilies. Anyway, uh, what was lying behind this is, was the grand, a no-nonsense man, Leopold. Uh, this, I mean, they must have sought themselves out, so this was going on like that. Well, the next thing was, of course, for the parish was uh, the French Revolution and Napoleonic troops entered the city. Three times they came in. And of course, one of the main things to pay for Napoleon's confused, he threw Italy into utter confusion. Tuscany came to an end for a few, a month, a few years. It became the, the kingdom of Etruria, and there's a whole story about that. And later, directly part of the French Empire with three departements in, in Tuscany and so on. They wanted money. So the churches, all the churches were affected throughout Tuscany and elsewhere. The church had to be ransomed. The church, by the way, forgive me, is sent, dedicated to St. Gregory, the Illuminator, as we know, the great uh, Armenian saint. Uh, so they had to pay quick, and they didn't have the money, so they had to borrow it at 10%, 500 scudi, which was quite a lot of money, to get that. The next thing was, the soldiers then, or the command friend, we want your silver, please. As you, as you know, where Napoleon said they took in Malta and everything, it, it, uh, stole all the silver. And all the silver had to be go gone over. And it, as it had been a wealthy community at that time, uh, was, anyway, there's a slight change in the air, let's put it like that, uh, all the, quite a bit of silver. Surprise, surprise, which surprised the whole of Tuscany, was the emperor himself ordered two years later 
that everything had to be returned. The silver had to be returned <laughs> uh, to the church. And it was like, well, how, why is this Armenian church? We are not getting anything back. What's the, it's said there was Armenian influence in Paris that changed the emperor's mind and they got the silver or the equivalent back. Now, one of the interesting things really was a gentleman by the name of uh, Rustam Mamluk, an Armenian in the emperor's bodyguard uh, in his entourage, a, an Armenian, as I say, born in Georgia, but uh, taken as a kidnapped and enslaved and taken to Egypt. And then as a young man, the sheikh who owned him Gave, it, gave him to Napoleon as a present. And he went everywhere with the emperor and he wore these wonderful robes. There were other Mamluks in the French army. There was a platoon of them, quite a few, uh, you know, fighting in Moscow and everything else, so these Egyptians. And uh, th this uh, man may have, uh, he, he has, his memoirs are published, incidentally. They don't mention this event, but it could be what what is meant. What he does describe is that when the emperor was in a reasonable mood, and he knew the emperor very well, the character, because he was with him for some years. If the emperor is in a good mood, he might ask a little favour. It's quite possible that uh, uh, that this uh, Mamluk uh, had uh, done that, and it's the same. Also, it is said that he had influence in Venice when the emperor was in Venice. Uh, you know, the uh, Mkhitaryan monastery of St. Lazar was under grave uh, a crisis to be suppressed like other religions are, and there's valuable collections and distributed, uh, you know, whatever ha would happen to them, that he also interceded there indirectly. Who knows about that? Anyway, what time have I got left? Sorry. Sure. I can't see. Oh. Okay. The next uh, matter involving the church, after its recovery from that, was the um, you know, something a decision by the assembly of the day against the regulations. They didn't consult the community as a whole to restore the church inside to impose a classical style on the baroque. They demolished the high altar removed the, the curtain, the it is, uh, no longer there. They made it a simpler thing. The Baldacchino was removed and they did other matters in there, much to this. They brought in uh, new statues. So as soon as you say statues, you know that they've lost the, that Armenian tradition. There are no statues uh, under normal circumstances in Armenian churches. One of them, actually there's a photograph of there, was of Mary Magdalene was brought in, a statue, big statue of Mary Magdalene. <laughs> But the, when it was seen, the archbishop said, this must be clothed because she, <laughs> she's not, it can't be next to the high altar. <laughs> this is not. There's another case of the similar case in, in the Chateaus of, in Pisa. There was a statue there of a young uh, a, a lady in the sanctuary, whoever thought of that. So they, they had to add wings to it <laughs> to make it respectable. It was that kind of situation. Shortly after the restoration of the church, which many people didn't like, of course, about that, and they did it with the church was in debt again and so on. The 1848 revolutions throughout Europe, as we know, and it affected Livorno particularly because there was this kind of left wingish element in the port city. Later, in 1921, the Italian Communist Party was, the Gramsci found, was founded there in Livorno. And even today at football matches, I believe, I haven't attended, there's a kind of left wingish uh, manifestations and so on. So, and the mayor's a left wing, and so on, communist even. Um, well, the 1848 revolution that disturbed the city, the Grand Duke had to leave. It didn't affect the parish so much directly. But when the Austrian troops came in to restore the Grand Duke and restore order, um, they imposed a very heavy fine on the city and on the merchants, which affected the Armenian merchants, of course, which affected the income of the parish. So it, it affected the uh, St. Gregory the uh, indirectly. But also now I must mention that by this time, we're talking about 1848, uh, the port was no longer as successful as it had been. There were changes in trade movements and so on. 
uh, there were different ways of uh, carrying uh, goods from one end of the Mediterranean to another, etc., etc. Things had changed. I mean, there was no need for galleys and slaves. Slavery ended in 1750 uh, in Livorno, incidentally. And there were fewer and fewer, and, and uh, the, uh, these um, galleys were sold off, I think, some to Monaco, the Prince of Monaco. And even Richelieu, I believe, bought some at another stage. So it's declining in trade. Uh, Livorno is going down a bit. Some people have different views about that. The next matter that the church had to deal with was the Risorgimento. Uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, the Grand Duchy was absorbed into the Kingdom of Italy in 1859-1860. And now the church had to deal with a new set of regulations as put down by the Italian government, the new Italian government which was based in Florence and then later, of course, moved to Rome late, uh, later. Alas, uh, the Italian government had decided that, again, there'd be confiscations, right, left and centre. Uh, and this applied then to the Armenian church. Um, what was the source of income? Now that the um, merchants, uh, the richer sort of person, had gone to other fields, it was the the stipends left for masses for the dead, and it was not insubstantial. Um, the government said, no, that belongs to us, because the church belongs to us. Why? Because the, because the, the pr previous government, the Grand Duchy, the Grand Duke, uh, appointed the parish priest and paid him. See, so it came back uh, like that to, uh, to knock the, communi uh, the community on the head a bit. Well, there was much discussion about this, and lawyers were brought in, articles were written, um, and then they appeared, well, look, the people who, uh, who left this money were Ottoman subjects. So the Ottoman ambassador in Florence was brought into it, and big discussions about that. Uh, no, and then they claim, some of the Armenians there in the we are Ottoman subjects, because this business of subjects is a bit uh, vague in some cases. When it was first established as a city, city status in 1606, something, a lot of things happened in that first decade, there were only a hundred citizens technically, including foreigners, but they had to be Catholic. And, there, there, and then there were additions, Armenian uh, merchants were added and so on. There was an Irishman appointed as a, as a citizen and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, there was a compromise, fortunately. They had to pay a large sum of money, and then uh, they could keep these stipends. And then the Holy See intervened, because Italy was in chaos, because uh, the money was changing into the lira. There were so many masses, that, so they, they decided to cut down masses for the same money. There's a special term for it, which I used in, the past, in, in my past life, but I can't remember what it is. So instead of saying 50, offering 50 masses, for such amount, it could be 10 or 5 and so on. This was just a practical matter the Holy See had to deal with. Now I'm going to move on to when uh, the parish priest from whom a lot of this information came in his book, which he wrote uh, when he returned to Constantinople, um, Mesrob Ahulian, arrives as parish priest in 1879. What does he find? Well, it's not a happy sight, let's to say. There are hardly any Armenians left, they've all gone, or they have uh, gone into the uh, district, scattered. They have married, as is often the case, married uh, into Italian families and so on. Nobody is, very few are speaking Armenian. He tries to establish Armenian lessons, nobody's interested. Uh, for the liturgy, he trains 10 Italian boys to sing the liturgy, and with great success, apparently. He gets some Latin rite priests of Armenian descent to learn the liturgy and to help and so on, and that works out quite well. And, and, and this. He restores the curtain for the liturgy and so, uh, and so on. He tries his best, although I think at the end, he's there nine years, he's glad to return to Constantinople because the life of the parish has really uh, been ex uh, extinguished in a sense, one could say. There were, uh, even among the apostolic, uh, there aren't many there really left in, in Livorno. 
I just move on now quickly. The church survives. Second World War. Livorno has become a shipbuilding, uh, very important shipbuilding uh, port. And today it's very important. It's one of the largest, um, what you call, container ports now in, in, in the Mediterranean. So it's got, because of its, uh, this industry, it's heavily bombed. And only, I'm told, 8% of the old city, of what we're talking about, has, remains untouched. The, the Armenian church is bombed and it's not built up, but the, but the facade survives. I'll just show you a picture of it in a moment. Um, now, the big question out of all this, really, perhaps the most interesting question, and I think perhaps, perhaps Father Nurses would be able to add to that. Why was it that the Greek Catholics had a church so quickly, 1604, whereas the Armenians, Catholics, had to wait another century. Why was it so long before there was this meeting in 1669? And this is uh, an interesting question to try to solve. Um, the Greek Catholics of the Byzant uh, Byzantine Rite were very well known in Italy. You know, in southern Italy and Sicily, and the bishops and Grosse Ferrata and so on. Uh, Greek Byzantine establishments and so on, very well known. The Church, the, the, the church of Ro uh, the uh, Holy See knew them very well. Well, yes, but they knew the Armenians very well. I described it a, a few minutes ago about how well embed embedded they are in Italian society by that time. So what was, was, what was the problem exactly? I think it might be uh, uh, it might be that in the 17th century there was great confusion in the Armenian world. That's my thought. Um, people may not know what was going on. You had a great deal of trouble in Constantinople with Patriarchs being uh, sympathetic to Cath uh, Armenian Catholics in the city and then others coming along. There's a whole story there of difficulties of, and struggle between Catholic am Amirs, and, uh, Amirs and so on. Um, there was trouble in Poland. Trouble in Poland. A trouble in Aleppo. What are, the, what are ordinary Armenians thinking? A lot, most of them would remain faithful to Echmiazim, but then you have uh, conversions to the Catholic Church. The Latin missionaries are arriving, causing consternation. Of course, the, in their mind, of course, we couldn't accept such a thing now. They, they had in mind, we must bring all these good people <laughs> into union with Rome for their own sake, you know. Uh, Florence has failed, and etc. We must go and do that. And they caused a, a great deal of confusion. That can't be denied. I mean, many of them are goodwill and maybe not so for vanity reasons, ambition or whatever. So there was all that kind of uh, problem. There was no Armenian Catholic hierarchy to speak of. Later, yes, in the 18th century, we have ordaining bishops in Rome from 1715, something like that. We had Armenian ritual vicars in Constantinople, 18th century. And of course, then we had the uh, uh, Catholicos elected and, uh, and uh, recognized by Benedict XIV, Adzivian, who become, becomes the first Catholic uh, Catholicus or uh, Patriarch of Cilicia. All before, there was, of course, I just mentioned Poland, but Tarosovic, who came into, uh, is a bad word among <laughs> many people, he came into, but he was still in power, in power, until uh, 1681, quite late. And then there was difficulty with his successor, Hunanyan. So that wasn't a place where the Holy See could latch on to, to find out what is going on in Livorno, exactly. And it's a port city, there are people coming and going freely, apostolic uh, clergy and bishops even, I should say. Uh, on one occasion, uh, an apostolic priest came. He had great influence on the community uh, to such an extent, uh, so successful, that the community made an appeal to the Grand Duke to get rid of the two Armenian Catholic priests. So he expelled them like that. Of course, the, pu the Pope was furious and they had to go back into it. And it's interesting to know why the Grand Duke at that moment agreed to that knowing that he would upset, not that they were too worried about the Holy See, although they had three popes, of course, 
uh, Medici popes uh, in the fam uh, from the family, um, but it may have been due to a letter that he received from the Catholicus explaining the difficulties of uh, the Armenian community at that moment, uh, but also the letter originally was to ask the Archduke to sort out a will of an Armenian apostolic merchant that had got into an entanglement. Anyway, that's uh, th uh, the case there. Um, what else was there? Uh, I think I've mentioned... Oh, finish now. Yes, okay. Well, that's a, a big question, I think. And it's worth, it's a kind of reflection of what was going on in the, in the 17th century until it sorted out. But I finish with one thing. Um, I mentioned the merchant who arrived in 1682, Mirman. Well, a direct descendant of that uh, merchant is alive and well in Livorno, Manuela uh, de Chirac, uh, de Chirac uh, Mirmanian. Last year, she handed over, because she's the last one, she handed over all her family documents to the Matena Duran, the manuscript museum in uh, Yerevan, Armenia, for safekeeping and for study. Uh, so we began with the name, the same family, Mirman, the f first family we know of for the name, and we finish the story of Livorno, which is much more complicated than I have done, but anyway, there we are. That's Livorno for you. Thank you.